Because if you didn't know it, King Jesus is coming. He said, when you see these signs, I am at the door. How many are seeing these signs? He's at the door. And he's not coming back for a church that's asleep. He's coming back for a church that's on fire, doing the work of the kingdom. And my story's really simple. Well, it's not really simple, but it's pretty quick. I came to this country when I was four years old with my family. We were immigrants from the Middle East. I know Pastor said, I know I sound and I look Latina. I am Egyptian through and through. I get into a lot of trouble in Spanish churches because nobody understands why I need an interpreter. Like, why don't you preach yourself? Yeah, in English. I don't speak Spanish. They don't believe me. Um, but we came to here this country when I was three or four. I got saved in the Assembly of God Church when I was four years old. And I fell in love with Jesus at four. That's my story. I fell in love with Jesus at four years old at an altar in a church. And I never looked back. I served the Lord all the days of my life. So when we talk about children's ministry, man, it is powerful. I am a product of an Assembly of God Church children's ministry. My parents were believers, but my personal experience was at an altar at four. I got filled with the Holy Spirit at nine. I got called to the ministry at 11. I started ministry at 15. And so a huge part of my life in the kingdom happened way before I ever graduated high school. God did a massive work. So let me tell you about youth and, and children, man. We need to invest all our resources into this generation. They're not the generation of tomorrow. They're the generation of today. And the enemies put a mark on them. So the church needs to rise up in support of them. We need to surround them with love and encouragement and kingdom. And can I just, can I just be a, a former youth pastor for a minute? Can y'all leave them alone? Can you leave them alone? Don't pick on their hats and their tattoos and their ripped jeans. If you can't see butt cheeks, leave them alone. Let them come in because the church will snatch them. The world will snatch them from us. We need to make the church safe for them to come in and experience the move of God. We need the church to be welcoming. We need to rally around them every time they walk in this place. They need to feel loved and cared for. We'll deal with sin. We'll deal with it. We're not going to ignore it. But we're going to teach them to fall in love with Jesus. Because when I fell in love with Jesus, nobody had to talk to me about sin. Nobody had to talk to me about it. I knew him. And my whole life, I wanted to please him. So I had a relationship, not religion. That's the difference. We keep giving our teenagers religion. This is wrong. This is wrong. How about they fall in love with Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do what he does best? And so I started pastoring at the age of 18. When I was in Bible college, I pastored for many, many, many years. I worked in an ethnic church. I was the first Egyptian ordained woman in the assemblies on the East Coast because I was already pastoring in an Arabic church in the midst of men that did not want me there. But see, God, God is so funny because he sent revival to my youth group and not the church. And the adults were jealous of the teenagers because they were getting filled with the spirit. Miracles were happening. We went from 35 teenagers to 300 in a matter of seven months. And God kept blowing up the ministry. The youth outnumbered the adults. And God worked. And then God moved me again to another church after eight years there. And the last church I pastored in was Evangel Church in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. And it's a church of about 1,600 people. And I was the associate pastor there. And I ran the ministries. And I worked in the ministries. And I had 88 ministries that I managed and worked with. And I was full of a holy discontent. I was full of a holy... See, I was born in fire in the spirit. So when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit at nine, we went out on the streets evangelizing and I led my first person to the Lord. I saw miracles, I saw God moving. And then I entered the church world. Hello? And I didn't see those things. See, I was a kid that actually believed every word I read. So I would come to church and sit exactly where Pastor Tony was and wanted to see this happen in church. And then when I became a pastor, I wanted to see this happen in church. And we would see glimpses, but we didn't see this. And I began to become discontented with the church in America. 
See, I traveled the nation. I saw Israel. I saw, I saw India. I saw Africa. I saw what church looked like when people were hungry. And I saw a very comfortable church in America. Sitting in church like it was a reclining chair. Entertain me. Heard complaints all the time about worship. Well, I don't really like that song. Well, I'm so glad we're not worshiping you this morning. Someone sitting in my chair, then sit on the floor. If you're hungry, you'll sit on the floor. Complaints about parking lots and parking spaces. And I was like, we, we're missing something here. You think we're running a, a celebrity club here? We're here to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And God began to move in my heart. I, my pastor knew I was talking about it all the time in every meeting. I don't want to talk about parking spots. How do we get a move of God in this house? I don't want to talk about anything else. And as long as God was in a box, we were never going to have a move of God. As long as we told the Holy Spirit, you're allowed to show up between announcements and this song. Do whatever you want there, but keep it tight, Holy Spirit, because we have other things to do. It wasn't going to happen because that was a disgrace to the Holy Spirit. And so in January of 2020, I resigned from my full-time position in what most people in ministry ascribe to get that job. It's the job. You know the job? The CEO, this manager. In Christian world, that was the job. But I didn't want the job. I wanted the call. I don't need the job. I needed the call. And so in January 2020, I resigned. I left everything, left my salary, my health insurance, everything that was there. And the Lord said, will you be a revivalist? Go out to my people. And don't pastor a church, help pastor the church. We're not building one church, we're going to build the kingdom. And I'm going to put you in front to ignite my people to remember who they are. See, a revival is different than an evangelist. An evangelist goes to the world, right? It's, they go to the world like Billy Graham and they call in the unsaved. The revivalist is a prophetic call. It comes to the house and it does this. Wake up. Wake up, church. Let's return to who they're supposed to be. Let's go back. We don't have to find a new way to do church. Let's go back to the old way that we did church. And the revivalist comes in and begins to beckon the church to be what God has called them to be in this hour. And then so January of 2020, I left my job. I left everything and I started uh, traveling and preaching and had 15 flights prepared. And then March of 2020 happened. Can I tell you something about God? I didn't flinch for a second because when you obey God, your obedience is your business, the consequences are his business. And I didn't miss a beat. The second COVID happened, I was sharing with Pastor Tony, it was like gasoline in my fuel. I knew exactly what was happening in the spirit, prophetically, I understood what was happening and I began an online prayer meeting to begin to charge like lightning through the darkness that was around us. Because what came with COVID wasn't just sickness, it was fear, it was manipulation, it was, there was so much that was released in that moment. COVID was the was the mirror, everything was behind it. And we watched the church get lost. We watched the church get lost. And so the Lord allowed me to be like a flashlight in the darkness of what was going on there to speak and to clarify who we are, who we are. And we began to move and now that prayer meeting that still happens every Monday and every Thursday, we have something like 23,000 people praying with us from all over the world. And we have seen, I was here with the women uh, uh, yesterday and one child that we were praying for got healed while we were here. I got the text because we've been praying, we've been standing, we've been declaring. We've seen people saved, delivered, set free, healed. We had 17 people in one family get baptized in the Holy Spirit on the prayer meeting, online. And so God has used it for his glory. And that was birth in COVID. And it's available to all of you to come and pray with us. You just put my name in your app store. You get an app of the ministry. You'll get a message when it's time to pray. You'll be able to pray with us, participate. Send us your prayer request. Because we are called to be a house of prayer. Not a house with prayer. Which is what we've settled for. 
is a house with prayer. What does that mean? Oh, I want a burger. Can I have pickles? Can I have tomatoes? Oh, those are optionals. I, I don't really need them. No. Prayer is the burger, not the pickles. But the church has made prayer the pickles and not the burger. And God is saying, no, my house is a house of prayer. That's the only thing we're commanded to do. We're not commanded to have children's ministry. We've created that. We're not commanded to do anything else but to pray. Everything else, we've added. And they're good things. But we can't remove prayer to bring in the good things. We have to do the God thing. And so we've started praying. We pray together. And God has begun to exponentially raise up the ministry. I released my fifth book, March of this year. Um, and it's called The Courage to Stand. And you talk, you're looking at somebody who does not like to read or write. So if God tells you to do something that you don't like to do, just do it. Because he's in it. I, I never wanted to read or When God told me to write a book, I was like, God, you got the wrong person. I don't like to read. Give me the auto book. I want to hear, give me the movie. I don't want to read anything. In Bible college, we have to write this um, pledge when we have chapters to read. You say, before the Lord Jesus Christ, I promise that I have read chapters 1 through 10 of this textbook. I would write before the Lord Jesus Christ, I have skimmed chapters 1 through 10 of this textbook. <laughs> I want nothing to do with it. But I've written five, and my fifth one was called The Courage to Stand, and it's a prophetic charge to the people of God to understand who we are. And I know I'm talking to a house who understands terminology like remnant people. Remnant people. This book is a call to the remnant church to understand who we are. Because if you don't realize that there are two churches being built in front of us right now. There is a remnant church. And remnant literally means remain true. That's the deaf simple as that. Those that remain true. Till when? Till the end. Remain true. And then there's the corrupt church. That is corrupt. But they will call themselves the church. But they will be itchy-eared, culture-driven, emotionally charged, demonically run church. And we are seeing it with our own eyes. We are seeing supposed men and women of God begin to embrace doctrines of demons and calling themselves the church. We're watching the Methodist church recently ordain their first trans pastor who preached on a Sunday morning in a tutu with makeup all over his face, holding the Bible, saying it's time to deconstruct the Bible. And it's time to reimagine Christianity. And I said, I said, bro, you're lucky your building didn't burn to the ground right now. What are you saying? We're watching the church begin to be deceived. And Jesus warned us of that. He said, in those days, pray that you're not deceived. Because many will come and say this, 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 and this. Don't believe them. So the remnant people are people that are saying, I am going to remain true to this word. I'm going to remain true. And what it says, I yield to. See, the difference between the corrupt church and the remnant church is one simple thing. It's posture. It's posture. Many of the things in your walk with God are going to be about posture. So the corrupt church takes the word and stands over it. And they scrutinize and take it apart and decide what God is saying. And if they don't like something, they just remove it. Or they change it or say it's invalid now. The remnant people, they go under it. They yield under the word. And they become whatever the word says. And they alter and they change. And if the word says something's wrong, they just do it. And if they hear God saying something different, they yield. That posture is the difference. But if I begin to look at this word like I have the right and the authority to scrutinize it. We've eaten the apple all over again. This word is to be yielded to, not to be criticized by me. How arrogant could we be to think that we could stand at the word of God and criticize it? That's the corrupt church. Because now they've given over to their feelings and not the authority. They've given over to the culture and not the authority. They've allowed culture to dictate 
what we're supposed to be when God has already dictated what we're supposed to be. There is no new way. It's the old way. And if that means that we are isolated, if that means there's only a bunch of us, so be it. So be it. There's a saying that says when the entire culture is running across over a bridge, over a cliff, the one running the opposite direction appears to be insane. Anybody insane in this building today? Because I am. I am. Let them run over a cliff. I'm going the other direction. I'm going the other direction. And so God is raising up a people in this hour that are going to be his people, that are going to stand as the people of God. You know, I was sharing with pastor that the church is always too many steps behind. We're too many steps behind. We got to catch up. It is a shame that the people that are standing against the evil curriculum they're trying to bring to our children are Muslims and uh, Jews. They're the ones that are holding the line. Where's the church? Where's the church? God bless the Muslims and the Jews. God bless them. But they're doing our job. That's our job. The church is always three, four steps behind because we don't want to offend. Can we just offend? Can we just defend and do the work of the kingdom? We can love. We can love, but true love tells the truth. I don't love you if I don't tell you the truth. I don't care about your soul if I don't tell you the truth. When I went to India a few years ago, I bought a sari, because why not? So I bought a sari, and I was preaching with her on a Sunday morning. I watched a YouTube channel, and I did the sari, and I got on stage, and I finished preaching our first service at my old church. And then the second service was about to start, and as I was getting down from the first service, four beautiful Indian women met me at the bottom of the stairs. I said, hey, sis, what's going on? They go, come with us. They pulled me into the back of my seat. What are we doing? We got to fix your mess. (laughs) They took apart the sari and put it back together, and they're like, this is a mess. They fixed it up. I went back, did the second service, and was so blessed. You know what that's called, family? That's called love. Love doesn't leave me in my mess. Love calls me out of my mess and is willing to get their hands dirty to get me out of my mess. They could have left me like that. Let her look foolish. No, they loved me too much to let me look foolish. And we have to love this world too much to let them stay in their mess. We have to call them out. We have to call out other believers and say, hey, there's a job to get done. And we need to speak the truth. We need to speak the truth. And if the truth is spoken from podiums, and I challenge pastors all the time, and I love your pastor because he speaks the truth. And you are blessed in this house to have a man of God that speaks the truth. You are blessed. And I have to tell you that it is rare. So you are blessed this morning. But if pastors speak the truth, they have to embrace this. I'm going to preach the truth, whether it fills the building or empties the building. The Church of America has been shook up. That's what COVID was. COVID was God shaking up his church, exposing his church. We found out something. There's a reason why people haven't returned to churches. You know what they found out? That we actually don't believe what we're peddling. We talked about faith and big faith, and we talked about authority, and everyone ran and hide. The church should have been on the move in COVID. We should have been out the doors. When the riots were happening, we should have been in the streets. We should have been praying with people and being present. We were just sitting there watching the news, waiting for it to end. We don't understand something. See, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against the enemy. And the church is sitting around waiting. God, when are you going to do it? When are you going to raise up a standard? And we're waiting. We're confused. We have the wrong perception. He's not sending anything else. Jesus already said, go. (laughs) That was 
the instruction he gave the church. He said, go. See, we're not waiting for the enemy's next attack. We are the attack that God has risen up against the darkness that's around us. It's the church. When God, when enemy comes in like a flood, God raised up a standard. That standard has always been his people. We are the standard that he raises up. We are the authority. We are the anointed ones of God. We are the sons and daughters of the most high. And we are sitting in our seats waiting for something else to happen when we are what should be happening. We should be advancing. We should be taking ground. We should be front and center. We should be advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Every day, every moment, until he returns. See, the only answer to a woke nation is an awakened church. There is no other answer for a woke nation. It's an awakened church. The hope of the world is the local church. There is no other hope. Our world is lost. Duke University has started studies on children from six months to two years to see if they can recognize trans tendencies. You want to tell me it's not sick? It's not demonic? We have demonic agendas being embraced all over our nation. And can I tell you, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. America's just embraced it, that's all. You're talking about centuries ago when there was a god named Baal who had a wife named Asherah. Asherah was the goddess of pride. Her, her joy was to take men and castrate them and place them in dresses and parade them through the streets in the month of June. Centuries ago. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new. America has just embraced it. And they've welcomed Satan. And they've welcomed his darkness. And the church is still in their reclining chairs. It's time to kick out their reclining chair. It's time to stand up and be the people of God. It's time to speak into the darkness. It's time to get our feet dirty and begin to move. We gotta put our boots on, family. It's time for war. We cannot sit idle and quiet and wonder, wonder what God is going to do. This is the deal. We keep waiting for revival. And I'm a revivalist. I'm all about it. But the Bible says this, signs and wonders follow them that believe. They didn't say signs and wonders sit with them that believe. They follow. So what does that mean? There is a motion to the church. It's not sitting here, God, when you give, no, no, no. You got to step out and begin to move in the things of God and he will equip you. You will feel the fire as you begin to pour out yourself before the kingdom. We keep waiting for this thing to happen. No, it's in the motion of the church. I am 1,000% I am a city girl. This is country to me. Where I live is country. I am 100% a city girl. I grew up in Brooklyn. I, grew, I went to school in Manhattan. I, I am a city girl through and through. But I have three nephews that don't understand that. They want to go fishing and hiking. I'm, I'm not your gal. I'll take you to the theater. I'll take you to a nice dinner somewhere. I'll take you shopping. That's my jam. I am not fishing and jumping. But my nephew had a birthday. He said, Auntie, we're going to go, go on a boat, all of us together. We are? Yeah, we want to go fishing. Will you take me fishing? And I'm, and I'm a sucker for my nephews. I'll do whatever they want. I'm like, sure, absolutely. We'll get on this charter boat, all of us together. <laughs> and I'm already there three minutes. My shoes are wet. It stinks like fish. I'm already grossed out. The guy's got guts on his overalls. I'm like, this is going to be a long day. And I, put my, I get my fishing pole. I'm like, Maddie, how long are we here? He goes, oh, it's a six-hour ride. I'm like, six hours? I'm going to stand in this spot for six hours? He's like, Auntie, it's okay. Now, middle nephew, we think he's going to be a pastor. He walks over. He goes, Auntie, it's okay. Just, I'm going to help you. I'm like, Nathan, this is disgusting. He goes, Auntie, it's okay. We're going to have a good time as a family. Oh, oh, okay. All right. He goes, let me help you with your bait. Take your bait and put the hook in the eye. 
I was like, Nathan, put the hook in my eye and put me out of my misery. Like, there's no way. There's no way. So he helps me. He, he baits it for me. And I, right beside me in this boat, I see this woman who looks just as enchanted as I am. So I lean over to her and I said, who trapped you? She goes, my son. She goes, what about you? I said, my nephew. She goes, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to get through this together. We're going to put a smile on our face for our kids, and we're going to get through this together. She goes, okay. She goes, I don't know what to do. I said, oh, you need help? We'll help you. Nathan, go help her. <laughs> help the woman. <laughs> so he baits her stuff for her, and her and I just commiserating the whole time. We're just joking. Six hours in, we had a little bit of a storm, so we're talking about that. And then we're getting off the boat, and I never like to leave someone's company without offering prayer. Didn't talk to her about the Lord. Didn't ask her anything about the Lord. But as walking, I said, ma'am, you know, I'm a pastor and I'd love to pray with you before you, you go. Is that okay? She goes, Sh sure, sure, I guess. Yeah, sure. It's great. So I put my hand on her shoulder and I begin to pray. My nephews are so used to this by now. They're just waiting. And as I'm praying, I get a prophetic word for her. I said, ma'am, I don't know anything about you. I said, but the Lord wants you to know something very specific. Every day when you leave your house, when you walk by your door, an angel meets you there. And that angel walks with you all day. He doesn't leave your side. He's there to protect you and to guard you. And every day that angel walks you back to your house and to that same door. Every single day, she is undone. She's hysterical. And I'm just waiting to see, you know, what this is about. My nephew's now looking. <laughs> what is happening? And when she finishes, this, this fishing trip was during the riots that were happening. She stopped, she goes, you don't understand. You don't understand. She said, I'm a single mom. I don't have one other person in this world. It's just me and my son. We don't have anybody. She said, I'm a police officer. And I'm managing these riots. She said, and every day I go to that door that you're talking about. I stand at that door and I hold the door and I say, God, if you can hear me, please bring me back to this door for my son. Bring me back here for my son. And you just told me that an angel meets me at that door and walks me and brings me back to that door. You know what that is? That's the church advancing. That's the church advancing. That's the role of the church. That's what it means that signs and wonders will follow. I have to sit there and God give me a prophetic word. He's going to give you a prophetic word as you move. He's going to give you miracles as you move. He's going to give you, you have to begin to move church. Sitting still is not an option. We need to begin to move. And what you need will come. It'll come. But he's looking for people that are gonna step out. You wanna know how to rescue this generation? Stop telling them what God used to do. Stop showing them what God is doing. Let them see a living, breathing, moving God. Let them see signs and wonders. Let them see God moving in our midst. You don't have to wrestle them in the church. They'll come running in the church. And I feel today, Pastor Tony, that God wants to impart in this church today a portion of faith. He wants to put in this house the gift of faith. Because you guys made a declaration that you are a regional revival center. Well, that declaration requires faith. That declaration requires big faith. And it requires this kind of faith. It requires reckless faith. Not calculated faith. Reckless faith. And reckless faith comes together with something else. Reckless faith has to be married to reckless obedience. They have to go together. They have to go together. Reckless faith has to be married to reckless obedience. Because there's this first in verse Corinthians that we love to quote, and I love it too, so I'm with you. But in first Corinthians, second Corinthians, I'm sorry, 120, it says this, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God and through us. So we believe that all the promises of God are yes and amen. amen. Amen? What does that mean exactly? Let's break that down for a minute. That means if God said it, he'll do it. 
That's it. That's the, the simplicity of that verse. If he said it, we say yes and amen. We receive it. But I need to tell you something about that yes and amen. He'll do it. He'll say it, but he needs the people that are going to believe it. The promise of God, sometimes we think the promise of God requires me to do nothing. No, there's a requirement. There's a requirement. And I want you to look at this story very quickly with me this morning. I'm going to read it out for us. It's in the book of Romans. Romans 4, 17, it says this. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who was believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which are not as if they were. And then it goes on to say, who, talking about Abraham now, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to him who spoke. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he prom- that he who promised was also able to perform and therefore was according to him as righteousness. I want you to hear this as I break this apart. So God, the book of Romans is starting and he says, he says, there is a God that we believe in that is able to call things that are not as if they were. Well, that kind of faith, that kind of belief requires a great deal of faith because I'm calling things that don't exist to exist. It's a creative God. It's a creative God. God is able to create what doesn't exist. But you need a gift of faith to walk in that. Because we are fickle people. And we are impatient people. But real faith has no time limit. It has no expiration date. It is about your time and God, I'm just in. Yes and amen. So he begins with the story of Abraham. And Abraham's taken on a journey with God. And God takes him to the beach and pulls out some sand. And he says, Abraham, can you count this? He says, no, I can't count it. It's too many, God. He goes, okay, count the stars. He says, I can't count that either. He goes, your descendants will be the same as the stars in the sand. Nobody will be able to count them. And Abraham's like, okay. He's 75 years old the first time he hears that. 75 years old, the first time he hears that. And then eventually when he has his child, he's 100. And the Bible says that when God speaks to him, I want you to hear, when God speaks to him, he did not consider the deadness of his body. And we're all adults here. Okay, so we can understand what that means. Fill in the blanks at that point. He, his body is dead. He is, he is no longer functioning in a way that can have a child. He is dead. He says the deadness of his body and the deadness of Sarah wounds. So she's dead and he's dead. And God said, you're going to be a father of many nations. But Abraham didn't even consider it. He knew the fact. But he didn't consider it. What does that mean? He didn't take it to heart. He didn't take it to heart. It was not a factor to Abraham because he reckoned in who was speaking. Hear me this morning. Please hear me this morning. He reckoned into who was speaking. The voice of God was bigger than the deadness of his body, was bigger than the deadness of Sarah's womb. It was bigger. It was bigger. He said he reckoned in the voice that was speaking, knowing that if he said it, he would be able to bring it to pass. He didn't look at what was dead. He looked at who was speaking. Do you understand it takes no faith in the world to look at something dead and call it dead? It takes no faith. Well, that's a fact, Pastor, right, but it has no faith in it. It might be a fact that he was dead. It might be a fact that we're in a valley of dry bones. Those are facts. But that takes no faith. It takes all the faith in the world to look at something that's dead and say, live. It takes all the faith in the world to look at your child who looks dead to you. They are so far from God, from everything that you've put in them. They've lost their mind. 
They're living all kinds of lifestyles. It, it takes all the world to say, my child is lost. It takes all the faith in the world to say, my child's going to live. <sighs> but that's the reckless faith we must have. That reckless faith demands for us to speak faith, even when everything looks dead. Abraham knew his body was dead, but he did not consider it. He didn't allow it a place because God was speaking and he believed in the God of the yes and amen. If God said it, he'll do it. That's it. There's nothing after that. And that's what reckless faith is. God is speaking. Everything else doesn't matter. That's the recklessness of faith. It's God is saying, go do it. You leave your church. Quit your job. Quit your title. Trust me. And I say, God, you'll make a way. Yes and amen. People say, did you hesitate? No. No. I didn't hesitate. Because I knew who was speaking. Like, well, you're single. That's, that's okay. I'm not single, actually. I have a great big God. <sighs> I've never been single day in my life. King Jesus has been with me every day. I have a great big God who has made a way nine million times. And that reckless faith requires a reckless obedience. Because you have to understand something. Last time I checked in scripture, there was only one immaculate conception. <laughs> only Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. So Abraham and Sarah had to go home and use their deadness in the old-fashioned way to make a child. Come on, family. They had to use their, the old-fashioned way to make a child when they were both dead. You know what that's called? It's called reckless obedience. They had to go home and obey God. And obey God. And obey God. And so a year later, Sarah was pregnant. It's reckless obedience. But reckless faith and reckless obedience comes from deep intimacy with the Lord. There's a trail there. I cannot recklessly obey a God that I don't intimately know. If I don't know him deeply, I cannot trust him deeply to obey. See, I know the Lord my whole life, so obeying him becomes real easy for me. He's my best friend. I talk to him every day, every moment. People say, what's your prayer life? Look, I said, it never stops. I walk with him all day. You don't have a set time? Sure, I have a set time. That's all day. <laughs> That's all day. I'm not walking a minute without him. I'm talking to him before I walk into every meeting, before I walk into every, every second of the day, I'm speaking to him. He's my life. He's not part of my life. He is my life. And you can recklessly obey your God when you know him well. See, Abraham knew God. And Abraham was the master of the recklessly obedient. Because he obeys God when his body's dead. And God gives him a son. <laughs> and then God says, that son, you love too much, Abraham. I want you to sacrifice him to me. And the next day, he takes his son. And he begins to walk up to the altar. And his son says, Dad, there's no, there's no sacrifice for the altar. And he goes, God, God's going to bring the sacrifice, son. Let's go. And he brings, I want, I want every dad to hear what I'm saying today. He takes his little boy whom he loves, whom he waited for. This was the promise. And the Bible says he ties his son up. Can you visualize that? He puts his son at the altar. He extends his own son's neck. He grabs his axe or machete or whatever that he had in his knife. And many of us want to believe that Abraham was going one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. God will step in any time now. Any time now, God, you want to stop me? That's not what Hebrews tells us. The book of Hebrews says this. 
that Abraham was so confident in God's word that he knew that God would raise his son from the dead. That's what, that's what the book of Hebrews tells us. He thought his son was going to die that day by his hand. But he was going to wait for God to resurrect him because God gave his word. That's how much he believed in the yes and amen. That even if me killing my son happens, you're still going to keep your word and make him the heir of many nations. You want to talk about faith? So he didn't lift that sword counting. He lifted it with full force to slit his son's throat because God told him to. And in the midst, an angel stops him. Abraham, what does the, what does the angel say? Don't harm your son. God now knows that he's first. The ram is in the thicket. That's your sacrifice. And the Bible says that every time Abraham believed God, it was accredited to him as righteousness. It put him in right standing with God. See, reckless faith is married to reckless obedience. Reckless obedience is married to intimate relationship. There's a chain there. You cannot believe God greatly if you don't know him deeply. You can't believe God to show up if you don't know him deeply. One of the greatest testimonies of my life is I was in Africa on a missions trip. And we're doing a kids crusade in this place called Amtoro, 99% Muslim. And the pastors, they were really excited we were there and they were like, you know, this is really good. We've never done anything like this before, but the Muslim parents aren't going to let their kids out. So if you have about 100 kids, you, you'd be really happy. And I'm like, pastor, if they give us 10 kids, they want to serve the Lord, I'm good. Like numbers have never been my deal. Whatever God does is what he does. But I'm going to, by faith, plan for 250 kids. And he started laughing. He said, sure, no problem. When I knew God had led us, I knew God was speaking. I was obeying the voice of the Lord. We get, we're driving to the field, and I see hundreds of children running towards the field. I'm like, what has happened? We get there. I look around the place, hundreds of children. I was like, okay. Everyone begin to make circles so we can start counting. Circles of 20, uh, no, circles of 50. Okay, circles of 100. <laughs> we had over 1,000 children, all Muslims, all Muslims. And we had about 200 mamas with their hagebs on the side over here. Some fathers in the back just kind of watching. And there was a man who was walking and he was chanting. So the team is setting up. They go, what do we do about the witch doctor? I said, I'll take care of the witch doctor. You keep setting up. So I start walking towards him. And he looks at me and the person that was with me, he goes, you need to leave here. I said, we're not leaving. You need to leave here. Or you can join. Either one. But we're not going anywhere. And we began to pray. He began to pray and then he took off. And we covered the ground with the Lord. Then the Spirit of God. And we started our crusade. As we're starting, the pastors grab me and they go, look, they're now nervous. They go, we didn't expect this. This is actually quite serious. Um, so we have a couple of instructions for you. Like, okay. They said... We're going to give you a mic. The mic might make a strange noise because it's attached to a battery, attached to a car, attached to something else. Just throw the mic so you don't get electrocuted. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Check. No electrocution. Fabulous. And then they say, and when you preach the gospel, if you could avoid saying that Jesus is the Messiah, that would be great. So I'm thinking, well, that's kind of the reason why I'm here, but... So I said to myself, Pastor, I want to honor you and respect you. You know, this is your place. But what would you like me to do if the Holy Spirit tells me to say he's the Messiah? So well, we don't want you to disobey the Lord. It's so great. But if he doesn't use that exact word, use something else. Okay? He's like, use, use, use Lord, use King, but Messiah in the Islam culture is very, very clear. So I, I kind of thrive in clarity, but okay. Um, <laughs> he's like, we really, and this is all we would really appreciate because they could riot at that point. And I'm like, okay. And they said, you also have to be done by 545 because our permit is only till six 
And if anything, if you stay after six, they can attack us. Nobody will help us. I'm like, okay, I got it. I got my three checks. No problem. We start the kids' crusade. It is amazing. A thousand children singing, Jesus, you're my superhero, dancing, worshiping. We pray. We pray. The children are all in. I come to the message now, and I'm preaching. I have a translator with me, and I hear the Lord clear as a bell. Tell them I'm the Messiah. I said, okay. I said, I want to tell you today about Jesus, the Messiah. And the translator goes, are you serious? And I go, translate. And he goes, and he translates. You know what happened? Nothing. Like a blanket. And the children just listened. And the Lord said, tell them again. I said, Jesus is the Messiah. He translates. I talk a couple more sentences. He goes, now invite them to know me as the Messiah. I said, how many people here today want to know Jesus as their Messiah? Every child raised their hand. Every single one. A whole bunch of mamas raised their hand to give their life to Jesus, the Messiah. We pray the sinner's prayer with them. The mamas take off their hair gaps and begin to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord with us. We are worshiping. We are, I mean, we are having church in the middle of the jungle. We start praying for the sick. God is healing all over. It is incredible. But the men that were in the back vanish. I have no idea where they went. But we're too busy caught up in what we're doing. And then it's 545 and the pastors come running and they're like, look, we got to get you out of here. So let's get you and your team moving to a safer part of town and then, you know, you'll be okay. So we get in the car. It's myself. It's one of my teammates, a translator and the driver. And we're driving in Africa. When they want to ambush a car, they cover the road with rocks. Rocks as small rocks, but as high as the car and as deep as the car because you can't actually go around the road. The roads are all destroyed. You actually have to stop the car, get out, move the rocks so that you can keep going. But that's a point of ambush. That's when people are killed. That's when people are robbed. And so we're driving along and I have recklessly obeyed God now. We're driving. We're driving. We come up to the top of the hill and we see ahead rocks covering the road and men standing on both sides with, with lanterns in their hands waiting for us. And we're driving and I'm, I'm completely under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I hear the Lord say, tell the driver, don't slow down, don't speed up, just keep going. So I translate, have the translator tell him, the driver goes, what is she talking about? I said, keep going, don't stop, don't slow down, don't speed up, just keep going. And we're driving, we're praying in the name, in the name of Jesus, we're speaking in tongues out loud, and we're declaring the word of God. And as we're moving, his hands are shaking. He's Muslim. He's Muslim. He is trembling. He's got tears running down his face because he knows what this is. And as we get to the rocks, God is my witness, family. We come up to the rocks, same speed we're moving. The rocks split on both sides, and we went right across, right in the middle of the ground. We keep going. We're rejoicing in what we just saw. And then we look, and the road is blocked again. It's blocked again. So we continue moving. The driver says to the translator, what does she want me to do? I said, I already told you what to do. You keep going. You don't stop. The, the plan that night was to kill us. We kept going. The rocks for the second time fell on both sides, and we kept going. <sighs> We come a third time. They were going to make sure that we weren't going to make it out alive that day. It was set up for the third time. And as we're moving, the driver this time doesn't even ask. He just keeps going. And the rocks fall for the third time. And we are worshiping Jesus. We're worshiping. They had weapons. They were prepared. But God was there. We pull up to the hotel. We are rejoicing in our Muslim driver with tears running down his face looks at us and says in his broken English, who do you serve? Who do you serve? What kind of God do you serve that would do this? And we got to lead our Muslim driver to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
See, what this world needs to see is reckless faith. It comes from reckless obedience, and it comes from deep intimacy with God. None of these steps can be missed, but let me tell you something. The only thing that's going to match what we see out here is a church with reckless faith. That's all that's going to match it, is a church that is truly operating in their DNA with signs and wonders with miracles and the miraculous and the supernatural move of God. There is no other match. And the Lord already established that in the book of Acts. We just got to go back to it and become what he's called us to be in this hour as his people. Don't look at the deadness around you. Don't look at the deadness. Don't consider the deadness. You can see it. Don't give it any place. Don't, don't look at the deadness of your marriage. Don't look at the deadness of your children. Don't look at the deadness of your bank accounts. Don't look at the deadness of your body, your doctor's reports. Consider who's speaking. Consider who's speaking. What voice is going to be louder in our ears, church, when the whole system fails us? When they put chains on our doors and say, you can't enter this building. When they call our Bibles hate speech. That's around the corner. Can you not see it? Can you not see the circles? The, 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 the um, horses going around the church? Circling? Making us the enemy again and again and again and again. There is a plot from the kingdom of darkness. But I don't consider that. I consider who's speaking, that we are a victorious church and the gates of hell will never prosper over the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I don't consider those things. I consider who's speaking, who's able to call things that are not as if they were. And today in this house, God wants to impart faith to his people. He wants us to begin to be reckless in our faith, reckless in our obedience. We say the same way, we want to say yes and amen to the miraculous. He wants us to say yes and amen when he speaks. We want his yes and amen, he wants ours. We want God, God you said it, yes and amen, and God said I said it, now do it. Yes and amen. Recklessly obey me. I tell you to forgive, you forgive because I want you to do it. You clean out the things in your life by saying yes and amen. Stop messing around with things we shouldn't be messing around with. There is no time. There is no time. There is an urgency in the air. Can you not feel it? There's an alarm that's being sounded over the church. He's given us a window to get ready and then things are going to accelerate. Here's our window. Get the house in order. Get that, hear me prophetically today. Get the house in order. There is a window here for us to be who we're supposed to be. And we don't have to be perfect, but we have to be obedient. 